So how do I see you? Can you see me? I think you have the option to uh, go ahead and put gallery view to see if you need to post Yeah, that. let me try to find that option. Oh, sure. Also, thank you to everyone who has joined so far. We're going to give it about five minutes for people to join. So we'll start the webinar at 5.30. Uh, but this is the Society of Colleges and Universities webinar put on by Central Valley Scholars and Dr. Kelly Dwight. Uh, so just go ahead and hang out for five minutes um, and we'll do some more explaining and introductions. So for the folks who are in here, in case you are wondering why your audio or camera or chat is not working, uh, we just automatically turn those off for our attendees uh, to protect your, your identity and your privacy. But we do really, really encourage you to use the Q&A function or the raise hand function to ask your questions or also make any comments, um, even if it's just to like type up the post or um, say that you know of a certain person on the slide or anything like that, please do engage in that way. Um, but again, because the webinars are all recorded and posted on our website after the fact, uh, we really want to protect your identities and make sure that you don't you know, disclose your photos or names. Um, so for the remainder of the webinar, audio and cameras are off, but please do use the Q&A box um, for any questions, comments, as well as the raise hand function, and we'll make sure to call on you. But yeah, we'll be starting at uh, in about three minutes, so 5.45. Awesome, welcome folks. Uh, we're just giving it a couple more minutes to let people join. This is the Historically Black Colleges and Universities um, College webinar presented by Central Valley Scholars uh, in collaboration with Dr. Khalid White. Um, I am Katya, my, name, uh, my pronouns are Shikar A.I. I'm the events coordinator for Central Valley Scholars. Um, I know many of y'all have heard this already, uh, but we're just repeating it for people who, as they join. Uh, so yeah, we'll be starting in a couple minutes. Just hang tight if you are wondering why your audio camera um, or the chat box is not working for you. It's just because we automatically turn those off for our attendees when they join. So to just protect your privacy. Um, and, and yeah, because these are all recorded and can be found on our website after the fact. Um, so definitely check those out. Check out all of our past webinars as well. Um, and yeah, the Q&A box is already up and running. If anyone would like to draw questions, comments, concerns, and we can just take a note of those to address at the end of the webinar for the sake of time. There's also the raise hand function if you want to be, um, if you want to unmute, we can manually do that for you. You just have to raise your hand to let us know and we'll get to you as soon as we can. But yeah, in the meantime, just hang tight for about another, another few seconds. I think we're good to go. Khalid, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and hand it off. Or actually, um, I'll go ahead and start. Awesome. So it looks like we have quite a few people in here already, which is awesome. Again. My name is Katya, uh, joined by Dr. Khalid White. Before we get into the actual content of the Knowledge is Power Historically Black Colleges and Universities webinar, um, I do want to talk a little bit about our organization and what we do. So if we could go to the next slide. Uh, 
Awesome, perfect. So in case anyone is not already familiar with Central Valley Scholars, maybe this is the first webinar or this is some you have taken advantage of. We are a 501c3, which means we're a nonprofit organization based in the Central Valley, based uh, mostly out of Central Valley students um, currently in their undergrad, some are transitioning out of undergrad or transitioning into it. Um, we create accessible pathways towards higher education for historically underrepresented communities in the Central Valley through public workshops like this, um, workshops slash webinars. Um, typically in the summer, we would offer in-person workshops. However, we've had to do them um, as webinars online for the past year or so. Um, but it's been great. Um, yeah, so super happy to have you all here. We do also, in addition to these workshops, have mentorship programs. We have a Black mentorship program, as well as a um, first-generation mentorship program. Uh, yeah, so definitely read more about this on our website. I believe applications have closed for this fall, but we are always looking for more um, STEM tours and uh, just volunteers for any of our future events. We do also give out over $12,000 worth of scholarships to different folks uh, with various identities from the Central Valley. We have uh, two Black student scholarships, a disabled student scholarship, LGBTQ scholarship, the first in the Central Valley actually, and um, a first gen scholarship and then documented student scholarship. So if any of those apply to you or you are interested in scholarships in general, definitely check those out. We also offer research programs and empowerment programs um, that you can all learn about on our website, centralvalleyscholars.org. Um, and also please follow us on social media. We love to promote all of our events on there, any applications or other things that um, similar organizations are doing will definitely um, be promoted on there as well. So yeah, with that, I'll go ahead and go on into the next slide, which is gonna be a land acknowledgement. So um, I'll go ahead and read this statement off really quickly and then we'll get into actual content of this webinar. But we do wanna acknowledge that although we are in physical, physically um, different spaces and we're on Zoom right now. Um, we're all on uh, different indigenous territories and this land acknowledgement is specific to uh, the Yopitz territory, which makes up, makes up the um, majority of the Central Valley. Um, so I'll go ahead and read this off and I encourage you all as I read it to just close your eyes, plant your feet on the floor, take a few deep breaths or do whatever you need to do to just feel grounded in this space. And just to have like, a small moment of reflection before we get into the heavier content. So I want to take a moment to acknowledge where we are and that the earth below our homes and below our feet is Yilkut's territory. And it has belonged to and been tended to by the Yilkut people for hundreds of thousands of years. And that when white settlers arrived what we otherwise know as the United States, they enacted genocide and theft of the land, labor, and resources, attempting to write out our indigenous communities entirely. It's important to acknowledge that the land we're living on and recognize its history and relationship to the ongoing legacy of colonization in the US. And to also recognize that the Yopitz people are still here and that the resistance and resilience are still on the front lines struggling for land rights, collective liberation, and an end to white supremacy. So I invite you all to take a moment to think about your relationship to this land and its history and that those two have come before us in the struggle and form us where we're going so that together we can reimagine and collectively build the world where we're all free. And so with that, take your final breaths and come back into this cruise. And I will actually now hand it off to our host, um, Khalid, to introduce himself and get into the content. But again, one final reminder, please um, raise your hand or type out in the chat any questions or comments y'all might be having, and we're happy to answer them either as we go or saving them until the end. Yeah, I'll hand it off to you. Well, thank you, Kathia. I definitely appreciate Central Valley Scholars for having me. Thank you to the audience and participants who are here and those who are on the way. I definitely appreciate you, your time, your attention, your eyes and ears. I am Khalid White. I am an educator in the Bay Area and I have been doing um, education. I have been you know, doing my thing in the classroom for a little under 15 years now. Um, I spent several years um, in higher education, teaching ethnic studies, sociology, you know, working with young people um, and young adults. In addition to being in the classroom, as it says here, I'm a writer, an author, a filmmaker, business owner, a whole bunch of other things, a father, you know, a husband. But I want to also point out that I'm a proud alum. HBCU alum of Morehouse College. Morehouse College is the nation's only 
all male historically black college and university. And I'm a proud alum of that school. Um, and to be truthfully uh, honest with you all, without my experience, without the academic and interpersonal foundation that I received at Morehouse College, all these other dots you see and all these other accolades by these dots probably would not be there. Um, I always consider myself to be an intelligent and confident person. However, it was the experiences, the training, the tutelage, the support that I received at my historically black college, Morehouse College, that really propelled me um, into being uh, just greater than I could imagine at 18, 19, 20, 21. I was able to make lifelong connections, make lifelong friendships, develop a sense of self and a sense of pride. And that's why I'm so high on the HBCUs and the HBCU experience. Again, I was able to do all these things that you see on this slide, but I'm also um, an alum of an Ivy League school, Harvard University, where I got my master's degree. I was able to go off and get my doctoral degree at UC Davis and also at Sonoma State. I have a joint degree. But again, without the foundation, that the historically black college and university, Morehouse College in my case, set for me, none of that, um, I don't think any of that would, would have happened for me. So again, proud HBCU alum and supporter, and thank you all for joining in and tuning in to learn about the historically black colleges and universities. You may have seen movies like Beyonce's Homecoming, or Drumline, Stomp the Yard. You may have heard about some of these historic Battle of the Bands or homecoming celebrations that the HBCUs have. You know, some of your um, uncles or maybe your parents or even grandparents may have seen movies like School Days or shows like A Different World that came on in the 80s and 90s. And those kind of give you an idea of what happens at the historically black colleges and universities. And we'll dive into a little bit more about that, all right? So here we go. So you may recognize a few of these faces, you know, some familiar faces um, from luminaries, thought leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who himself also attended Morehouse College. Um, you may recognize Vice President Kamala Harris, the current Vice President, a Howard University alum. You may recognize people like Oprah Winfrey or some of these Hall of Fame athletes like a Jerry Rice. Um, even recognize people on this slide like P. Diddy or Spike Lee, Samuel L. Jackson, who they both went to Morehouse College or you know your favorite hip hop artists, Two Chains or Common. You may see some names that, or some faces, excuse me, that are unfamiliar. Maybe Booker T. Washington, maybe that name rings a bell or W.E.B. Du Bois thought leaders who set foundations for people of color in the United States for hundreds and hundreds of years. These individuals and more, uh, A-list actors, entertainers, politicians, lawyers, doctors, icons, each of these individuals has in common that they at one point in their life were historically black college and university students. Some have gone on to be, you know, game changers change the world in certain cases. Some you see on your TV or you hear on your radio. Again, the historically black colleges create leaders. And we'll talk a little bit about some of that leadership and some of that impact that these tiny little colleges, most don't have a student population over 3000, right? Tiny schools, the school where I work at today, San Jose City College has a population of 10,000. When I was a student at Morehouse College, less than 3,000 students, but we'll get to that in detail. You may recognize, or may not necessarily recognize the face, but you may see on this picture, my alma mater, Morehouse College, had its first white valedictorian, Joshua Packwood in 2008. And he loved the experience so much, him being a valedictorian, having a 4.0, he loved the experience so much at Morehouse that he even suggested for his younger brother to coach the school. So historically black colleges offer scholarships, offer 
experiences offer the world for students of all colors, black, white, brown, green, orange, blue. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail, all right? Mentioned a little bit about the impact of these schools. If you take a look at this graphic, HBCUs create a huge professional impact in the African-American world and beyond, okay? In our nation and beyond, our historically black colleges and universities are responsible for generating so many of the professionals of color in our world, whether we're talking about PhDs and those in uh, education and higher education like myself, whether we're talking about engineers, doctors, attorneys, lawyers, these little bitty colleges in comparison to, you know, the big universities, these are small schools, but they have a huge impact, not only in America, but internationally. HBCUs are responsible for developing leaders across all professions. So keep that in mind when you're trying to select either a major or a career path, the HBCUs have something for you in terms of your professional career and direction. In addition to the professional impact, what comes along with that is economic and financial impact. There are over 100 historically black colleges and universities in the United States. And those schools collectively create over 130,000 jobs annually. And those jobs help to put money back into the American and international economies uh, to the tune of almost $15 billion a year. And that number is going to continue to grow. So the creation of not only jobs and opportunities and employment, um, the opportunities to really generate wealth for individuals and to generate uh, generational impact, generational wealth, not just financial wealth, but also intellectual generational wealth, which is just as important. The HBCUs, again, these little schools, over a hundred of them in our nation today, they have such a huge professional impact and also economic impact, all right? Now I have a question. You see this map of the United States. Why, and you can use your um, Q&A feature, but why, somebody help me out in the Q&A feature. You see where all the HBCUs are located, primarily in the South and Southeast um, portions of the United States. As a matter of fact, Texas is the furthest West, the state furthest West for these HBCUs to be located. Why do you think the HBCUs are located in the South and Southeast part of the United States? Use the Q&A function um, to, to locate your answer, to lend me an answer, please. Why the South and Southeast? Why don't we have any historically black colleges and universities in California or in Nevada, even Arizona, places like that, places in the West, Washington, Oregon, anybody know? Use your Q&A feature for me, use your Q&A function, provide me with an answer. A guess is great. Let us know your thoughts in the Q&A. No wrong answers here. Give it a couple seconds more. This is a little bit about history, US history. Okay, I see somebody in the Q&A. Two answers, all right, that's where most black people reside. Okay, Juliana, you're on the right path, definitely. Jim Crow segregation was mainly focused in the South United States. Although when it's north as Ohio and Pennsylvania, very good, Eli, great answers. Yes, you both are correct. In a sense, Jim Crow segregation and the fact that that's where most black Americans reside. And still to this day, there is some truth to both answers. So the historically black colleges and universities were primarily 
uh, begun right around, right before the Civil War and more so right after the Civil War ended, all right? These universities were started in areas, as was suggested in the Q&A, where most Black people resided at those times in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, the majority of um, Black people in the United States were located in the South due to segregation and formerly slavery, all right? So these colleges sprung up or were started where the critical mass was. And these colleges, many of them started off similar to how we would consider trade schools today. They were schools that were teaching Black people, newly freed Black people at this time, trades, skilled trades, or how to be teachers, or how to be preachers. Those types of trades were, you know, in high demand, agricultural trades, skilled trades, and also to be teachers and preachers. So most of these um, historically Black colleges and universities have their origin as almost training ground trade schools. Today, the HBCUs have blossom into liberal arts colleges and universities, some private, some public, but all of them are liberal arts colleges that you can get a degree in engineering, mathematics, your STEM fields, as well as things like history, political science, and sociology, which was my major. Um, so the glow up and the grow up has been real for the HBCUs. They started off as training ground schools and you know, kind of trade school, so to speak. And now they are full-fledged colleges and universities still training people to go into the world being leaders and learners. The mission hasn't really changed. Um, the focus hasn't really changed. It's just, they now offer more opportunities. All right. So thank you all for participating in that Q&A and we'll move on. Feel free to use your Q&A later on. We'll have a question and answer period, okay? But the history of that is yes, that's where the majority of Black people resided in these South and Southeastern states, and also Jim Crow segregation and enslavement had something to do with why these schools started off in the Deep South and Southeast. All right. Now you might be asking yourself, like any other college, how can I apply to a historically Black college or university? And there's a couple of different routes. If you are a high school student, there are some options for you. Similar to your predominantly white institutions or your mainstream schools, if you will, um, the common application is one of the acceptable routes and one of the you know, sponsored routes. And so there are six public and private HBCUs that use the uh, quote unquote common app. However, if you wanna get more bang for your buck, the Common Black College app at the top, and you see the um, websites for both, the Common Black College application is accepted for nearly 60 public and private HBCUs for a one-time flat fee of $20. For that amount of money, you can apply to nearly 60 HBCUs, 58 um, is the exact number with the common black college application. If you are a California community college student, there is the transfer guarantee pathway, which is a partnership between the 115 California community colleges and 39 of the historically black colleges and universities. To be accepted into the transfer guarantee for our community college students, you have to have at least a 2.5 GPA or better and 30 transferable units completed. For each of these options, whether we're talking about the Black College app, excuse me, the Common Black College app or the Common Application or the transfer guarantee, it's recommended that you talk with your guidance counselor, you talk with your guardian, your parent, and figure out which is the best route for you. But if you are a California community college student using this transfer guarantee pathway, there's even more incentive. And we'll talk about that in the next slide, okay? Also, just to point out, for those of you who may attend HBCU fairs and HBCU tours, 
There are also opportunities to apply as a high school student or a community college student at a lot of times at these events um, right on the spot and get accepted right on the spot. So there are a couple, again, a couple of different ways to apply to the historically black colleges and universities. Each college and university has its own um, admissions, you know, kind of tab on their website. So make sure that you explore those tabs for the ones, the colleges that you want to apply to. Okay. Now, how can I pay for my HBCU experience? I don't know if you have heard lately or not, but college is pricey. Even if you attend a California community college, college can be expensive. Um, so many Americans struggle with student loan debt, college loan debt, that it becomes um, a hindrance for your wealth and generational wealth creation, okay? So you have to be very smart, very shrewd, and very astute when you're trying to find ways to pay for your HBCU experience, your community college experience, or your trade school experience. Whatever higher education route you choose, be smart, financially smart. But for our HBCUs, obviously, the best way to finance your, your education and your experience at the HBCU is to apply for grants and scholarships, AKA free money, money that you don't have to repay back, right? So scholarship consideration is a priority for students that are achieving a 3.2 overall GPA or better. You start opening some doors for yourself with a 3.2 GPA or higher. Your AP classes, your honors classes, you know, really strive to get those B's and A's because you'll start knocking on some doors or better yet, some people will start knocking on your doors to attend their college and give you some money to pay for it. All right, so there is a minority scholarship link, 101 different scholarships that you can apply for um, through this website, HBCU Lifestyle, that, that's um, their link. So make sure that you check that out. If you, again, are a California community college student currently or planning to be, the, the transfer guarantee pathway allows you the option or the opportunity, I should say, to transfer to one of those 39 partners HBCUs as an in-state student. Now that's really, really, really important to understand because in-state tuition is normally cheaper than out-of-state tuition. So California community college students that use that transfer guarantee pathway get to pay in-state tuition at their HBCUs. So you can come from California, and you can go to school in Georgia, Texas, Alabama, DC, Maryland. And even though you are technically an out-of-state student, if you are a California community college student going through this pathway, pathway, excuse me, you can get in-state tuition like you are a resident of Georgia or a resident of Mississippi or a resident of Alabama and pay much less in college fees, tuition, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this California Community College Transfer Guarantee Pathway has some real good incentives for students, financial and otherwise. And lastly, on this slide, you can see and you can reach out to the campus financial aid offices. And also you can take the opportunity to fill out the FAFSA, which is the federal financial aid application. Um, that application is typically open between October 1st and June 30th every year with most of the money being available and most of the financial resources being available closer to that October 1st date. As a matter of fact, I would really discourage you from waiting until June 30th to fill out your FAFSA, okay? Fill it out in October and get that thing going so that you give yourself the greatest amount of resources to finance your college education. And again, with the FAFSA, we're talking about a combination of loans in certain cases, federal loans. In certain cases, you may even be um, asked to fill out some private bank loans. 
And also with the FAFSA, they give out college scholarships. Again, the priority for students with a 3.2 overall GPA or higher for scholarships really starts to open up for you, okay? So make sure that you are maintaining your GPA. It's almost like your academic resume. You wanna make sure that your resume is tight. So a 3.2 overall GPA or higher is a nice resume. Looks really good on these applications, okay? Now think about this. I know some of you may be thinking, well, a historically black college, I'm not black, I'm Latinx, I'm white, I'm Asian, I'm Polynesian, I'm Indian, um, I'm first gen, I'm a dreamer. Please understand that the historically black colleges and universities they take all students, whether you are first gen, whether you are Latinx, whether you are an international student, whether you are Asian, white, biracial, whatever the case may be. Although my college, Morehouse College, was or is a historically black college and university, there were students there from Bangladesh, there were students there from Trinidad and Tobago, there were students there from Japan, there were students there who were white, there were students who were from parts of Africa and parts of Europe. And they were included just like everybody else. As a matter of fact, diversity and inclusion is one of the calling cards of the historically black colleges and universities because historically black people were left out of predominantly white institutions. So these spaces in the HBCUs have grown to be more and more inclusive. Well, they include all ethnic groups, they include all uh, races, they include all gender identities or sexual orientations. The HBCUs have something for you. And as is stated on this particular um, slide, especially in states like Texas and in Florida currently, the Latinx population at our historically black colleges and universities has soared, going through the roof. As a matter of fact, the international student population across HBCUs is soaring, going through the roof. Historically, Black colleges and universities are trying to diversify themselves. They want to have students who are not African-American among their ranks. Remember, I showed that picture in the first second slide or so about Joshua Packwood the first white valedictorian in 2008 that Morehouse College has ever had. And again, he enjoyed his uh, HBCU Morehouse College experience so much that he recommended that his brother go to Morehouse. And so now Joshua is a successful um, guy on Wall Street. And, you know, he made history at Morehouse College. But I say all that to say, our HBCUs, except you for you. They want you, particularly if you are a stellar academic student who is not African-American, oh my goodness. But don't take my word for it. I wanna share with you this short clip of this young man, a Latinx student who shares his experience attending an HBCU. We're not gonna watch the whole clip, but we're gonna get a short, you know, kind of sense of what that was like for him. Okay, so let me expand this and we'll listen to my man speak. What has your experience been like attending an HBCU? My experience attending an HBCU. <laughs> when I first came to Johnson & Smith, I had a cultural shock because I had never seen so many Latinos. It was it's almost comical, but yes, there were many Latinos. There were 20, which is not a big number, but it was more than what I was used to. And it was it, it is amazing. It has, the doors it has opened for me, it's just tangible. I'm always a person who grows on things. Like when I hear the stories, 
the traditions, the history, just you, you're like, you know what? I was supposed to be here. You know, it's, things happen for a reason to a certain extent, so okay. I so appreciate it. Is there any particular part of history that you've heard that made you feel that you should have gravitated to this place? I learned the history afterwards, but one of the things I learned, and it's true for uh, HBCUs, is that this school was founded with the help of the newly free slaves. And I'm thinking about it, I was thinking about it the other day, I'm not part of that legacy. When people 50 years from now tell the story of HBCUs, particularly this one, they will say, yes, it was founded in 19 or 18, uh, 70, 86, uh, and the first people were free black slaves. And then they say, well, in, then in the early 2000s, Latinos started to come in. And I'll be one of, I'm going to be one of those Latinos that came to the universities. Um, so I'm part of this legacy now. It's, it, I don't think people can understand the concept of it, but I'm now part of the legacy of an HBCU. So earlier you said. All right. So, sorry about that. I appreciate you all tuning in and listening. Hopefully, you learned something from that short clip. But that young man said that he was able to make history and be part of a legacy by attending the HBCU that. Uh, he attended Johnson C. Smith in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, also was mentioned that there were more Latino students there than he had seen before, which was a shock to him. It may be a shock to yourself, but again, the historically Black colleges and universities are not exclusive only to Black students. Students of all races, all walks of life, all gender expressions, all ethnic groups, all socioeconomic statuses, and even um, any other statuses you want to put in there, the HBCUs are a viable option for whatever box you check off or boxes you check off, okay? So we'll open the floor up for some questions um, and we'll go from there, okay? I'll stop sharing my screen and then we can... Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly. In the meantime, in case you haven't already seen our justice question, I'll go ahead and read it off. Uh, just to give people some more time to drop their questions or comments in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, but someone asked earlier, do students get charged out-of-state tuition if they attend an HBCU campus if they are not from that state? And I believe you had said, mentioned what that looks like. Um, for community college transfers and that guarantee, but wondering if it also applies to people who are not um, transferring. That's a great question. And thank you for posing that question. Um, so do out-of-state students have to pay out-of-state tuition? Yes, from my understanding and from my experience, you have to have residency in that state for two years. So. When I attended um, Morehouse College, I paid out-of-state tuition for the first two years. And then because I was able to claim my residency in Georgia for my junior and senior year, then it switched to in-state tuition. So that's kind of how I work the system, so to speak. Um, but yeah, you know, if you're not a California community college student on that transfer guarantee, you would have to uh, consider the out-of-state fees. So that's where the scholarships and grants become so much more impactful and important. So maintain that 3.2 GPA or higher, please. All right, no questions as of right now, but if there are any other resources, I know the organization, if you'd like to talk about it, um, in the meantime, I'll let people kind of jot down their questions and things. Um, yeah, if there's any other things you would like to plug. Okay. I'm sure some of you have seen, again, those movies like Stomp the Yard or Drumline with Nick Cannon. Um, you may have seen on Netflix, Beyonce's Homecoming, you know, where she, um, performed with like an HBCU band and that type of thing. So 
it's very, um, how can I put it? It's very popular or popularized the social aspect of the HBCUs. And college life itself is pretty social. Now the HBCU college life is very social. Okay, that's one thing that I, I will um, be upfront with. If you wanted to go out and hang out and kick it and party or whatever the case may be, you can do that every day of the week. There is something for you to do. So I would really encourage you to not only just look at the social aspects of it and the social dynamics, but also really, really focus on the fact that you're going there to college, going there for college, excuse me, and that you can really do some, some things academically. Okay? It has to be a balance of academics and social life. So just keep that in mind. All right, keep that in mind. A very similar question actually came up in the Q&A regarding um, just like the culture of college in general. Someone uh, or someone shared that they are going to high school with 1,600 students and Morehouse has about 2,100 students right now. How does the size affect the culture of the college? Great question. The size definitely affects the culture of the college and the culture of the campus. For one, the campus is probably the same size as your high school. You can walk across it. You don't need a bicycle like you would need at maybe a UCLA or there's no you know, campus bus system that goes around the campus like there was when um, I attended UC Davis, right? You can walk across the campus in five, six minutes for one. For two, because the campus is so small, there are some, some benefits to that we'll have a class where there might only be 10 students in the class. Now I teach colleges, college campus classes where I may have 90 students in a class, 60 students in a class. Think about this, if I'm teaching nine, 10 students, I can know who you are, I can know your pronouns, I can know where you come from, I can know the ins and outs, your major, all these different types of things. So we can get to know each other and understand each other on a more personal and sincere basis. When I'm teaching 90 students, you'll be lucky if I remember you know, your last name and lucky if um, we get a chance to talk one-on-one. -on -one. So the college campus atmosphere is much more personal. I had teachers drive me home after, after uh, class sometimes. I know that sounds crazy, but the teacher said, well, come on, where are you going? Oh yeah, I got you, I'm taking you around the corner. Oh yeah, I got you. We piled in the teacher's car, the teacher drove us home, you know? Um, that would never happen <laughs> at some of these other schools. And also, um, the relationships are much more sincere. You know, whether I knew you by name, I pretty much knew you by face if you were in the same class as me. And there are some people who, you know, I may have not seen since I graduated college in 2002, 20 some odd years ago, right? Or close to 20 years ago. But if I see your face, Oh, we went to school together and we're brothers. You know what I mean? It, it, it just comes back to, you know, we, we share that same experience or same experiences. We were on the campus at the same time. So again, you get a chance to know people, people get a chance to know you, you get a chance to know your professors and really you can make lifelong relationships, which is something that is very hard to do at a UCLA or a, uh, or a Stanford or something like that, with, particularly with your professors because you never really get a chance to sit there and. Um, you know, talk with them one-on-one. -on -one. So yeah, if your high school is 1600 students, I'm sure you kind of feel it's a small school and our college campus was very small, just like that. Very beneficial for me. If you have social anxiety, smaller classes, smaller, you know, smaller um, uh, student to teacher ratio is perfect for you. Yes. And yeah, I think that too is great for people who um, are the types of learners who need more individualized help mm -hmm. um, like office hours, I would imagine, are much more accessible that way. So Absolutely. yeah, thank you. Thank you. And then continue to ask questions like that, folks, if you are just you know, wondering about like the culture of the campus and not even like, how to acquire those things, like logistical questions, like just testing out um, like the different vibes and feels of college. This is all very important, especially if any of y'all are from the Central Valley or from um, places where there are not a lot of HBCUs that you can just go visit um, easily. Um, so those are really important questions to ask too. I think one question I have probably now that 
I think it might just be worth mentioning um, is maybe if there's any experience that you had uh, at Morehouse as like an all-male school that you think might have been different, had you gone to a different HBCU and um, you know how, how you liked it, just overall what your experience was. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's interesting that you asked that. As a high schooler, um, getting ready to graduate from high school and, and, and go to Morehouse College and it being an all-male school, that was interesting. I had never been in that environment. All the schools have been co-ed schools, right? Male and female and that type of thing. And so the all-male school experience actually, in terms of being able to focus, was helpful, definitely. In terms of being able to um, create a, a real strong peer group, that definitely helped. Although the school is all male, here's the catch. In that particular area, there are five other HBCUs within walking distance, almost literally across the street, including Spelman College, which is an all female school, Clark Atlanta University, which is a co ed school, Morris Brown College, which is a co ed school and a couple of other, two other schools, ITC and Morehouse School of Medicine, which are both co-ed schools. So although my college and my campus was co -ed, uh, was all male, the environment was still heavily um, mixed in terms of male, female, and those types of interactions. Our classes, you can take classes at the different campuses. So in some of those classes, it was all male, and some of those classes that I took, it was a co-ed class. I took classes at the other campuses. Women would take classes at our campus, et cetera. So you never really felt the fact that it was, you know, all male that, you know, in the way that I envisioned it when I, before I got there. So um, in a sense that helped me, that helped me focus a little bit. It helped me um, kind of ground myself and, and put myself around some, you know, other young men that were going in some positive directions. Yeah. The um, experience leaving California, very tough, homesick. Um, never had really left the Bay Area, you know, um, for an extended period of time, no. But when I got out there, you met people from all over the map. Uh, a lot of people from Los Angeles, a lot of people from the Bay Area, a lot of people from New York, a lot of people from Chicago and places like that, uh, Houston, Texas, Dallas, Texas, you know, all over. Um, so you start to understand that you're not going through it alone. A lot of people are homesick. A lot of people, this is their first time leaving um, their home, or, you know, their 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 city. And so, um, yeah, that was a that was a, a shock and a culture shock, you know, being out in the deep south, um, you know, new time zone, new new everything. But at the same time, for those of us in California to be able to go out and see something new and experience something new outside of our comfort zone, it really helped to grow me as a uh, young adult. Yeah, so I would encourage you at some point leaving the nest, you're gonna have to. As we wait for more questions, I'll definitely ask a couple more, a lot of people get comfortable. And please, this is just, okay, thank you. We just got another one. Um, I can read it out to you. So how do we encourage students to apply to HBCUs when we have large educational systems in California like the CSUs and the UC? Why would I encourage a person to apply to an HBCU when we have top-notch universities in California? Great question. Fantastic question, actually. Um, why and how? Okay. Why? The HBCU experience is something that you cannot get anywhere else. You can watch all the drumline movie you want. You can watch the Beyonce homecoming two or three times in a row. Unless you attend an HBCU, you will not get that same experience and environment. There's no way to duplicate it in the state of California. There's no way to duplicate it in the state of anywhere else outside of an HBCU. You can go to school in Georgia, but if it's not an HBCU in Georgia, it's not the same, okay? So that's one of the reasons. Um, the HBCU experience and the HBCU pedigree is very strong. You saw the impact, financial and also professional, that the HBCUs um, create. Now that's impact that is international, okay? If you are a person of color, 
and you want to attend a college that is designed for the success of people of color, you're talking about the HBCUs. Um, Fresno State is not designed with people of color in mind. Um, Cal Berkeley is not designed for the success of people of color in mind, okay? Our histories are very different from white Americans. And by our, I'm talking about persons of color, whether you're black, Asian, Latinx, et cetera, okay? Um, and so, you know, if you wanna go to a, an environment that is supportive, that is inclusive, that is designed with your success in mind, then you're talking about the historically black colleges and universities. You're not talking about um, a UC Riverside. And I'm not here to knock any college. Again, I've done the HBCU. I've been to an Ivy League school. I've been to a UC. I've been to a state college. And I also teach at a community college and I have a community college certificate. I've been to all the different levels as a student. Okay, and I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just saying that from experience. I have the experience at all different levels. Hands down. I wouldn't be able to have gone to these different levels and these different channels if I didn't first go to a historically black college university. My trajectory would be a whole different route. And I know that for a fact. I can say that now and look back on it. No way in the world I would have been able to survive academically or interpersonally at a Harvard University or at a UC Davis because the racism I faced there at those schools, the, um, the social isolation I faced at those schools as a young black guy, it was very real, okay? But my experience at the HBCUs prepared me for life in the real world, in a real world that's filled with racism, misogyny, sexism, those types of things, okay? So I'm just saying that to be completely honest with you. Now, how would I suggest people go to it, to the HBCU? I think that was the second part of the question. It was, how, how would you encourage them? How would I encourage? Well, firstly, I would encourage you to think about taking one of these college tours, historically black college university tour. There are several that leave from the state of California. And I took one when I was a senior in high school in 1997. I know it was a while ago. Some of you might not even been born in 97. However, when I took that black college tour and saw what was going on firsthand, I was sold. I had been on other college tours. I had done uh, summer programs at San Francisco State and Upward Bound at Cal State East Bay, and those different types of things. So I was familiar with other colleges. I had seen other campuses in California, San Diego State, beautiful, UC San Diego, beautiful right on the water. But when I went to the historically black college tour as a high school senior, that did it for me. It was over. I knew I didn't want to apply to San Jose State. I didn't want to go. I applied. I just didn't want to go. I applied to San Francisco State and got in. I didn't want to go to San Francisco State. I wanted to go to a historically black college university because of the firsthand experience that I got. The small, we, we were only there three days, but I just felt the warmth and I felt the welcome and I felt the um, inclusion when I took that college tour, that campus tour. So while you're making your college decisions, I would encourage you to take campus tours of your local schools or schools that you know are kind of within your area, maybe you can drive to, but also look for one of those historically black college and university tours. It may change your whole trajectory like it did mine. Awesome. We have another question. Someone asked, did your friend group at Morehouse also support you with your career path after graduation and were the connections that started at Morehouse uh, mm -hmm. also ended there? Well, the connections that started there, no, there's, we're still going today. I mean, I have a group of friends, at least 10, 12 of us, we talk all the time. Group text, we, we have a business together. Um, you know, those were lifelong connections. As a matter of fact, I just went to one of my sophomore in college roommate. I just went to his wedding about two weeks ago. So, um, you know, we're still friends, still, still BFFs, you know, um, and that's, probably going to remain the same way for life. Um, and did they help me with my career path? Yes, in a roundabout way. I had a good, 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 good friend of mine. And I got to give him props. His name is Jamel Moore. He lives in Los Angeles now. And we still, again, we, we still talk um, sure, a couple times a week. But anyway, long story short, Jamel recommended to me 
to go and start tutoring young kids. He was in a tutoring program and he asked me to come along and we started tutoring third and fourth graders and I fell in love with doing it. And I did it for you know at least two years. And so that in a sense gave me um, the experience and exposure to working with young people and that's what I do today. So did he support me in my career without even knowing it? Absolutely. If I didn't have that experience, probably wouldn't, you know, have gone into working with young people and young kids. And I teach at a community college today, but I started off initially working with second and third graders. So yeah, it was because of that experience. So he had a roundabout way that helped me along my career path. I'll never forget that. Raising Expectations was the program that we tutored at. And that tutoring program has turned into a full-fledged school in Atlanta now. They, they've, they've gone and done some great things through that tutoring program. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so someone else had asked if in the recording of the webinar that will be posted on our website after the fact, um, should be posted by the end of this week. Um, but uh, someone asked if uh, it would include what is in the chat. And I am honestly not sure, but I know we didn't put too much in the chat. So I can go ahead and read it off. But most of the links, if not all of them that we included in the chat are found on our website. So I'll, work, I'll go through it really quickly, just um, so that it also appears in the recording, just to be safe. But um, we do have pass, or we actually are hoping to have a common application slash private school application webinar later this year around November um, before final season, hopefully. Um, so definitely look out for that. We have done them in the past. We just don't have recordings of them available on the website. So for updates, of course, um, Central Valley Scholars is our Instagram and all of our social media handles. If anyone would like to follow them, please do. That's where we post all of our event flyers um, and link the RCP pages and all of those things. You can also view it. Yeah, you can also view um, the upcoming webinars as well as the recordings of all the past webinars, which will include this one very soon at centralvalleyscholars.org/events. So that's past and, past and future webinars um, are listed on there. And then for information regarding the student scholarship that we have, our scholarship page is pretty much the same, just centralvalleyscholars.org/scholarships. Um, and you can view the Black Student Scholarships as well as all of the other ones. You can apply for multiple scholarships if you qualify. Um, you have to be from the Central Valley and hold these identities, um, but definitely encourage you to apply or share them with people who uh, might qualify. I believe they have closed for this um, year's cycle, but definitely start looking into them for next year if it's on your radar. And uh, we had said for FAFSA and Dream Act, those both open on October 1st, uh, pretty much every year. So definitely keep an eye out for future webinars from us on that. But we do have recordings from last year. Um, I think with COVID and everything, deadlines or policies might be changing. So if you're ever unsure, you can always um, attend the live ones that we'll be having. And yes, I think those are all the resources that we mentioned. Uh, and we're coming up right at about time. So I'm going to double check for any last questions, but if, it seems like there aren't any. So Khalid, I'll hand it back to you to see if there's any like last words or pieces of advice that you would like to leave the students with, and then we are good to go. Okay, um, last words or pieces of advice. Yes, last words. Thank you all for joining in, for tuning in. Thank you for your questions. Um, definitely um, enjoyed my time spent with you all. I would really encourage you to not only think about the HBCU experience as an experience that has you in mind, but start to, um, if you're not at a 3.2 GPA or higher, start working on that so you can find some scholarships and grants that'll make your life better on the back end. Trust me, you don't want to have to pay off these student loans and all that different type of stuff, which you know I'm kind of doing right now. I didn't, I wasn't as smart um, as some of you are in being creative and financing your college uh, education. So keep that in mind. Um, lastly, I want to, again, thank Central Valley Scholars, but I also want you to incur, uh, want to encourage you, if you have any questions after this, you can feel free to reach out to Kathy or to myself uh, about this. You can find um, me online at blkmpwr.com, that's blackempower.com. Um, that's also my social media. Okay, BLKMPWR, 
You can find me also at blkmpwr at gmail. You can send me a, a email if you have any questions directly. All right. So I look forward to connecting with you and reconnecting with you. Um, thank you all again for attending. And I look forward to hearing about your historically Black college and university experience very soon. And thank you again to Kathia and to the Central Valley Scholars. Thank you all so much for everything. I had a crazy in the chat. And thank you, Khalid, again for this amazing presentation and sharing your experience on the HBCUs. This is going to be a great resource and it will be posted on our website. So for those of y'all who have shared that you would like to um, recruit other people to HBCUs or are going to one and would like to revisit this information, go ahead and check it out in a few days at that centralvalleyscholars.org slash events. Um, so happy to have had you. Um, and thank you all so much for attending. We're going to go ahead and end the webinar here. But again, thank you all so much. Alrighty. Have a good night.